How y'all doing? My name's OCD and today I'm going to be breaking down how I utilize CGI in the music video for David's trending single, Romantic Homicide, directed by Tommy Kiljoy. <laughs> That's a mouthful. So let's get right into it. First things first, we're gonna wanna analyze our footage. Some things that I'm keeping in mind are lighting, any objects that may interfere with that lighting, as well as focal length, aperture, frame rate, and color space. Next, it's time to gather our assets. We're looking for CG models, textures, as well as environment maps that match the general lighting of the environment we're trying to replicate. Opening up Blender and imploding the default cube, I will append a mannequin model that is to scale. I want to keep an accurate to real world scale. This ensures for the most realistic result. Then I will type in shift A to create a ground plane where I will follow it with S20. This ensures that my ground plane will stretch to the bounds of my scene. Following that, I'm going to add a subdivision surface modifier, apply it, and then set it as a shadow catcher. I'm going to want to start importing my assets. In this project specifically, I needed to import my train tracks as well as my CG freight train then importing the HDRI map that I wanted. So first, I click File and Append. Then I select the Blender project that I would like to append the object from, click on the collection where that object resides, and open it up into my new project. For any alternate file types, I'll click Import and then choose my desired file type, such as FBX, OBJ, or Olympic. Sometimes textures may be thrown off, as well as animations will be off time. So you'll usually have to go back and fix any of those errors. I'm going to want to relink the textures. This can be done by clicking on the principled BDSF shader and clicking Control Shift A as long as you have the Node Wrangler add-on enabled. Be sure to enable the Node Wrangler add-on. It is crucial for your Blender experience. I'll then select all of my different maps, the normal, the base color, the albedo, anything and everything. You select it all and it will import and create a node tree automatically. This is the power behind the Node Wrangler. Then, under the Shader Editor, I'm going to click the World tab, which will allow me to add my HDRI. Since I'm working with a shot at night, I'm going to want to set the strength down to something like 0.01 or 0.1. Really, the reason for it to be so low is to add just a little bit of extra detail in the lighting, but not enough where it drowns out the scene. This scene is mostly lit by a spotlight, which is also imperative to making your CGI look realistic. I recommend harsh direct lighting and emphasizing the shadows as much as possible. This will hide a lot of your mistakes. You can do this by either eyeballing it or post proceed speaking that this in question would be scaling your objects to real world scale. I don't know why I didn't mention this, but now I'm mentioning it here. So please forgive me. Kind of ironic though that I was just talking about a mistake and I made a fat one. Coming up with the specific measurements for each object and using the measurement tool to make sure that they align. I did this by eyeballing. And since I'm using a six foot mannequin model as reference, I figure that the door should be just below the tip of his head, assuming that he would need to duck in and under to get through the train. As someone that is a six foot human, that is typically what I have to do when getting on freight trains that I have never been on. So it's just an assumption. After the scale is set, I'm gonna be using an array modifier to extend the train tracks out as far as I need them. You're going to want to apply all of your transforms. This can be done by clicking F3 and searching for the apply all transforms option. You're going to want to do this because it will zero out your scale, your location, and your rotation, which is imperative to making sure that animations play through. It's hard to explain, but sometimes things just love to mess with each other, so I recommend always applying your transforms before you get into animation. And for the animation, it's incredibly simple. You're going to want to create two keyframes, one of the train starting before you can see it and finishing after where you can no longer see the train at all either. Then you're going to want to select both keyframes and turn the interpolation mode into linear, which will allow it to stay constantly at the same rate from beginning until end, rather than having a rise and then a stop and then a fall and then a stop. 
This keeps the motion constant and fluid as a train would be. It's important to think about how these objects would act in the real world if you were to see them. Now for the animation speed, you can either be precise about it or you can follow the trend of this video and continue to eyeball it. In order to be precise about it, you're going to need to find out the meters per minute that this train is moving and then set your animation accordingly. But I'd rather just plug in two random values, see if it looks good, and then if it doesn't, I just make it slower. And then if I need to make it faster, I make it a little bit faster. Personally, it's tried and true, rough it out. If you don't got the time for it, it will probably come out just as good. And usually your attention should be spent on other details rather than making sure that the speed of the train is moving exactly as it would in real world. But if that's what you wanna do, more power to you and I commend you because simply I just don't have it in me to sit down and deal with the math equation and figuring out how many frames it would take for the train to go from point A to point B and making sure that my animation aligns accordingly. Just sounds like a headache and a half, but once again, you do you. The important thing to keep in mind about lighting is the farther away your lighting object is, the less fall off there's going to be from that light source. So for something like a spotlight, you're gonna want it to be fairly close to the object to maximize the amount of fall off that you can actually visibly see on the camera. In this instance, I'm going to be wanting to render it out at 1920 by 1080, setting it to 888 samples just because I like angel numbers, then setting the frame rate over to 23.976, I'm using a color management space of Asus CG, which is very important to my workflow, but may not be as important to yours. Blender comes pre-loaded with Filmic. If you'd like to use Asus CG, there are many tutorials out there on YouTube that will show you how to get it into Blender, but essentially you're gonna have to erase your original configuration file settings and then import the newest Asus configuration. I like to export an OpenEXR, which gives me maximum flexibility in the color. Then I'll set it to half because I rarely ever find the need for full, put it to RGBA and set the output directory to wherever I'd like it to go. Next, I'm gonna fuck. Next, I'm gonna go into my layer pass settings where I'm gonna tick on for combined, mist, shadow, as well as diffuse direct, indirect, and color, and same for glossy. Then we're gonna move on over into motion blur. Once you tick on motion blur, you set the shutter down to about 0.4. I prefer it because I find it a little bit harsh straight out of Blender. Then I'm gonna check the tick box for the second preset that kind of looks like an upside down U. I don't know how else to describe it and I don't know the science behind it, but I can tell you this one setting makes the difference. In an effort to avoid 3D camera tracking, I need two different angles of this render, a close up and a wide. All I'm going to be doing is using the close up and the wide and object tracking to where they would be specifically seen in After Effects. And then for the alternative perspective, I'm going to reverse the footage so now the train is passing in the opposite direction. This allows me to not overexert my machine by requiring it to render more than it has to, but it also allows me to turn out a quicker result, which is imperative in working in the music industry. The quicker, the better. Time is money. Once everything's all set in stone, we're all good to render, where I will then wait overnight for it to finally finish by the morning. Praying that we had no issues and everything worked out hunky-dory, we're gonna wanna open up our settings inside of After Effects. We're gonna set our file, project settings, color to Rec. 709 as well as 32-bit. We are then going to import our 3D EXR layers as a sequence into After Effects, where we will interpolate the footage to Rec. 709 to 23.976 is the frame rate, as well as flipping it from 32 to on. Drag it into a new comp where you will then add the extractor plugin. This allows you to choose all of the different passes that you'd like. The combined pass is gonna be the main pass that we're working with. However, if you need some extra emphasis on either the color or the reflections or the shadows, that is where the other passes would be utilized. But assuming you don't need any of the other passes and you're only using the combined, you will then set an adjustment layer above the top of it where you will add your open color IO effect. The open color IO needs to be set to your ACES configuration, which will allow you to put the input 
as ASUS CG and the output as Rec. 709. On top of that, we're going to add a new adjustment layer with an effect called Color Profile Converter. Set both the input and the output to be Rec. 709, but on only the output do you need to check the linearize option. Then you're going to want to sandwich your color corrections between your EXR file and the open color IO adjustment layer. Following that, I like to pre-comp all my layers into one composition that I'm going to title combined that I will then import into my main comp with the plate included, where I will track my objects using Mocha Pro, making sure that I'm tracking the train track specifically. There is different motion based off of how close the object is to the camera. The further something away is, the less parallax, and the closer something is, the more parallax. So you need to be very careful and intentional about the objects you're choosing to track and what objects you're choosing to attach to that track. Once tracked, I'm going to add some minor compositing such as color matching, adding of grain, lens blur, and any other distortion like barrel distortion and chromatic aberration, where I will then send this off to be composited in by the lead compositor Tommy Killjoy himself, who added some things such as lens distortion, lens effects like smearing and raindrops, as well as light distortions, leaks, and scratches. These are all very important to making the entire image feel whole and really coming together and sold off in the final product. And in no way am I saying that this is the only way to achieve this type of result. This is just the way that made the most sense for me and the implications based on this project specifically, such as time and budget. This project was an absolute pleasure to work on. I couldn't be more grateful for David and Tommy Killjoy for providing me with their trust to do what I do. The video was rapidly exceeding over 11 million views and over 350,000 likes as of the time of me recording this. And that wraps up this VFX breakdown. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to drop a like as well as hit the notification bell so you're aware of when I post new videos every single Thursday. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. I would absolutely love to help in any single way and it would give me some ideas of what type of videos you would like to see from me in the future. And until the next one, be sure to seize the day and keep learning.